We are here today with Megan Matamo, founder and executive director of Advocating Opportunity, a program in Toledo, Ohio, and other locations, which I hope to hear about. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. So I want to dive right into it. So you founded Advocating Opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, tell me when that started. I founded Advocating Opportunity in, I believe we filed the paperwork in 2014, <laughs> and it was approved in 2015. And before that, I had started working with trafficking victims at juvenile court when I worked for the public defender's office. I started seeing a lot of kids in my capacity as a public defender at juvenile court who were involved in, in sex, what at the time was sex trafficking, um, but most people would see as prostitution or dancing in clubs or whatever, or labor trafficking where they were um, forced into theft rings, things like that, forced types of forced criminality. And, you know, the court wasn't quite sure what to do with them. Nobody really quite knew what to do, right? Because you don't want to punish someone in that situation. But also the court, that's what that's what courts do, right? <laughs> courts are not there necessarily to take care of everybody. They, they certainly try to. But, you know, the court's ultimately there to adjudicate mm -hmm. offenses. And you would have kids in on and things as minor as curfew violations or not being in school. Um, usually nothing too serious. Sometimes, you know, a little bit more serious. But... They never were quite sure, and they could see that something was wrong. And judges often noticed that something wasn't right, but couldn't figure out how to fix it. And so I started working with kids in those situations as a public defender and noticed that like nobody really knew what to do. And a nonprofit organization at that time was called Second Chance. They used to be part of Toledo Area Ministries, which has since unfortunately closed. And they worked with women and girls in prostitution specifically. And so we had a couple of cases that we worked together on. And uh, the, the program director at the time, Mary Schmidt-Bauer, and I were like, God, you know, this just this doesn't seem to be working. The way that they assign cases, especially if you don't have a lot of resources and you go to the public defender, you go whatever, they have, you know, certain attorneys are assigned to certain divisions, which makes sense, right? But if you are a client, you never, you don't always get the same attorney twice in a row, which means you have to explain and re-explain every time. And if you're a kid who's 13 or 15 or 16, you're already <laughs> having a hard time. And then to have to like re-explain things that are really sure. upsetting can, can be trying and they just kind of give up over time. And so I think the public defender's office has changed how they do that a little bit now, but at the time that's how it was set up. And, you know, we, we had a couple of cases that were very difficult and we realized you know if we could have the same advocate from their office case manager and the same attorney which would be me stay with the same kid and get reappointed every time that they'd seem to do better which makes sense like in retrospect it makes sense right at the time sure. we were like well, let's see if we can do that so we had a couple of uh, cases one kid in particular that we worked with um she was just extraordinary extremely bright Definitely a future lawyer, <laughs> if I could have convinced her to do it. Um, she ended up, you know, there was one time we were in a, a meeting together, and she asked this really bright question um, of everybody in the meeting about, you know, why did they always have to start out with the things that she did wrong? It mm -hmm. seems like it would be helpful to start out with the things she was doing well. And wow. why, you know, why do they always act? Why is that always that way? That's not very encouraging. And, you know, she really, and I was like, okay. She was really bright. So we worked on her case for a while. Um, and, you know, worked with other, other kids in that same situation and just tried to figure out how to do something other than locking them up and putting them in detention. Because at that point, that's kind of all that was available. And then around that same time, Lucas County Juvenile Court became a part of the Juvenile, Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative. So it's JDAI through Annie Casey Foundation. And that initiative, Lucas County has been a part of with five other test sites in Ohio. That initiative was meant to reduce um, the number and length, of, number of kids detained and the length of time that they are detained. So it went from, you know, having a full floor or full detention center of, of kids to now there's hardly anybody in detention. But at that time they were doing that as well. So I went to a lot of those trainings and we kind of worked out you know, a way of doing things. I worked with Judge Selwoman and Judge Coven at the time. Mm -hmm to figure out kind of what worked best. So at first we started doing, I think I'm pre-answering your questions. <laughs> no, please do. <laughs> at first Keep we going. started, I'm getting into safe harbor. At first we started doing, um, we had a different kid that we were working with 
and um, Judge Zellman and Judge Cummins and I and uh, Dr. Williamson were all from Celia Williamson from UT were kind of meeting about how to hand, you know is there a way to implement a statute or something write a law to figure out how to you know so that all courts are handling things the same way and we'd all met a few times um, and then Judge Zellman and I Connie Zellman and I kind of continued to work on that safe harbor legislation and co-wrote, co-wrote it together and sort of towards the end of that of 2011 into 2012 is sort of when we were working on that um and that law was ultimately passed in 2012 with an emergency position provision that enacted it and so it was effective immediately and what Most, does that law entail that law is it's had several <laughs> several revisions but it's supposed to be if you as a minor are picked up by police and charged with any kind of delinquency offense, which for adults would be a criminal charge, but because ju- it's juvenile, it's it's technically civil, but it's treated like criminal. So let's say they have a, a shoplifting, or they have um, simple assault, or they have um, truancy, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be anything up to you know felony assault, anything at all. The idea is to not continue to recriminalize them for things that they were that are tied to their victimization. So we know from working with human trafficking victims that often trafficking victims are forced to commit crimes that they wouldn't on their own do. And so the idea is to not um, criminalize them for things that they didn't have any choice in doing. And at the same time, you know, from Judge Zellman and, and Judge Coven's point of view, protect the public, right? Because they have a responsibility of making sure people aren't you know, being responsible in that manner, but also not using the court system to rehabilitate people in that way because it's only capable, right? Court is only, can only do so much. Sure. And so we thought there's gotta be a way to do this. So a- after working with kids from like 2008 is when I had our first girl that had the, is hopefully a future, will be a future lawyer. I haven't talked to her in a little while. Um, up until about that time, we started having informal discussions with uh, the Lost Innocence Task Force and uh, the other task force officers that are associated with that. So the FBI Lost Innocence Task Force, it's the Northwest Ohio Violent Crimes Against Children. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a very long acronym <laughs> um, that works with Toledo Police and, and FBI. And so we started working with them with that first child um, where we established a procedure by which I would be appointed as guardian ad litem. And then the person from Second Chance would work to do case management things that I, you know, because that point I'm by myself. I'm billing at the, you know, at the PD's office on this little mm-hmm. project that Henry was like, sure, go ahead, I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> you know, that sounds like it's 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 related. Go ahead um, for a little while until it got big enough, and I'm like, I think it's getting a little <laughs> a yeah. little out of hand. He was like, eh, whatever you want, that's fine. So he did, you know, let me run with it, which was really kind of him. And and Sean McNulty, who's now taken Henry's place, was also very very gracious and flexible. And, and, and let me work on this, which mm-hmm. was wonderful. That process, kind of through that trial and error from 2008 forward, you know, got got connected to law enforcement, got you know connected to that task force, and we just developed relationships. Um, you know, generally it was a little, we didn't really trust each other at first until we realized we were kind of on the same side. And in the, in that way, normally defense attorneys are not on the same right. side as the FBI, <laughs> but in that instance we were. So um, we you know figured out quickly a way to work with kids and clients that um, respected the priorities that they had and they were very good and in fact just fantastic um you know those those officers in the beginning for sure and still are um great about recognizing like there's certain things i can't tell you as a lawyer there's certain things that i can't discuss you know i can have my client can tell you if they want to and they were they were great about not pushing they were great about just being respectful of the spaces um because the goal isn't to get the kid in trouble the goal is to prosecute the trafficker and so we, over time, you know, kind of developed a process and that process became what Safe Harbor is. So we had another kid who was charged with, I think, trafficking in drug trafficking. So a couple of different first degree felonies in drug trafficking, which are very serious. But the officer who pulled her over, she wasn't driving. She was in the back seat. Or no, she was in the front seat. There was a driver. There was another trafficking victim in the back seat with the trafficker at the time. And when they pulled them over, they said, and I always 
think this is interesting too, right? You get pulled over and, and you know, the officer's like, I don't know why people think we can't see what they're doing in the car. Oh, in the car. We have this bright light on you. But they could see the one guy hand a big bag of drugs oh, to goodness. our client. And so he's like, I know it's not hers because I literally watched him hand it to her. But I don't know what else to do to help her. So I arrested her. I have no problem. You know, I, I know, I just want her to get to somebody that can help her. I know it's not her. I'm not trying to hurt her. I just don't know what else to do. And that was something we frequently heard. I'm not trying to hurt this kid. You know, I'm not trying to hurt him. Uh, you know, I, I just, I don't know what else to do. And so we kind of developed that process. So for that kid, we didn't have safe harbor in place at the time. Um, but we, you know, I asked her, you know, do you explain the situation, who I was, why I was there, you know, who that FBI would like to talk to her about her experiences. Would she be willing to do that? And she said, well, maybe, you know, I don't know. And I said, do I have to answer their questions? I said, no, you can meet with them. You can tell them you don't want to answer them. It's up to you what you want to do. And she did meet with them. Um, and that went well. They ended up dismissing her case. So they, they handled it more. I think it's a rule 21 dismissal. I can't believe I remember that. <laughs> rule 19. I don't know. It's a, a particular dismissal available in juvenile court. Okay. And it basically gives the kid six months to figure out whether or not. It's almost like it's like a diversion. So did the safe harbor law come into effect before you started advocating opportunity? Yes, it did. You're right. 2012. And then we formally established AO in 2014. But before I did that, we incubated under a Toledo Air Ministries with Second Chance. Because they realized after we had this case in 2011 into 2012, they were like, this is great. They're like, you know, we have some funding available for a contractor to help work with our other clients. Would you be willing to work with some other clients? And I said, sure. And that's when I said to Henry, you know, I think we're, I think, you know, I think we can get a little too big for, the, for this. <laughs> um, I don't feel right continuing to bill here. I have an offer sure. for some funding. Is that okay? And he said, yeah, great. So that's what we did is we, I worked um, as a, you know, employee or, you know, contractor of, of Second Chance. And we got a little bit of funding. I think it was 10000 the first year. I say we, it was just me. <laughs> and then it was 13000 maybe the second year. And then when we got to the point that we were able to file on our own in 2014, that's what we did. So if somebody had never heard of Advocating Opportunity, how would you describe what your mission is? We provide free uh, legal services. Um, we call them holistic legal services that address the whole person. So we have social workers and advocates available. We have uh, now a nurse advocate available to help people navigate healthcare needs. Um, and we have a conflict transformation app person available. She's not an advocate. And she helps people kind of work through difficult situations, either within themselves, communication, resolve communication, breakdown, those thing, little things that kind of get in the way of moving forward. So you know, legal services are anything from, you know, could used to be you know, family law, depending on what office you're in. If there's someone, attorney there who, who's good at family law or we have a pro bono partner who can provide that to, um, you know, juvenile delinquency as a guardian ad litem to landlord tenant. Um, we have a luckily we have funding from OVC, which is the Office of Victims of Crime to provide uh, material housing support so we can help pay people's rent, help pay, you know, car repairs, things that keep people from being stably housed. Um, so we're able to provide those services as well. And when did you expand to other cities? Columbus, we expanded, I believe, in 2015. And then Nashville was, um, we started out, I think, with about $20,000 at that point, And it was kind of just me again. <laughs> um, and then we applied for VOCA funding through the state of Ohio through the Attorney General's office, and we got it. And so we went from hardly any money to a whole bunch of money. And so then we needed to hire some people. And we did. We were working with Catherine Hulahan at that point, uh, who helped me start it. She um, has some experience in um, victims litigation. And uh, that's how Columbus started. So we hired some staff for the Columbus office, hired a couple of staff members for the Toledo office. And then we had an intern um, who worked on a project for us who was from Nashville. Uh, we did a... It is now a behemoth of, I don't know how many hundreds of pages, but it's a legal assistance framework. So if it's for lawyers who don't normally work with trafficking victims, who realize that one of their clients is, and what kind of things do they need to look out for? And so it goes through every type of law we could think of. So let's say you know, you're a personal injury lawyer and you find out your client's trafficking victim and some things don't, like you're not quite sure how to navigate it. We go through every statute and then have like little tips on how to, you know, what to look for, what you might want to pick up. 
who to call, who to, you know, things to look out for. And so she worked on that version for the state of Tennessee. So she created one for the state of Tennessee. And she was really enthusiastic. And she said, you know, when I graduate, I'd like to start one. And I said, well, we don't have any money, but if you want to, that's great. Like, we can, we'll figure it out at some point. And we did figure it out. So a couple of years ago, we got funding through OBC to slowly build capacity there. And then we got VOCA funding through the state of Tennessee. And so they have a little office, only five of them right now. And there's two openings. So they're, that's moving along as well. So it's going really well. So that's how that started. That just happened to be someone I knew who needed it. And so, she was really enthusiastic. So your three offices... Mm -hmm. um, how many attorneys do you have, and what is your total number of staff? Well, total staff now is 20. Total staff that should be there is 25, because we've got five openings. Three managing attorneys, one for each location, three staff attorneys, also one for each location, and then we have one part-time um, attorney in Columbus that um, her specialty is family law, and so she, she handles most of our family law cases in that office. So you've been in existence. Plus me. <laughs> You've been in existence for approximately 10 years. I know. <laughs> um, happy anniversary. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Approximately how many people do you think you've helped? <sighs> do you have a ballpark? I was looking at that, trying to go through all of my old record keeping when it was just me. And I think we're probably at least, probably seven or 800 people. Wow. Distinct people over that time. What's the demographic that you help? Is there a certain... It's sort of all person. over the place, really. Um, you know, we've had a, a f just a couple, but a few really young kids um, as victims in cases. That's only happened a couple of times, like three or four. Um, up to older uh, people as well. Like older, not old, but old as you would maybe think not in the demographic. So in their late 50s, early 60s. Um, and it depends on, on sort of kind of what case or what you're talking about. We get a lot of referrals for juvenile court. It's also different for each office. So each advocate, so some of our senior advocates, senior client advocates that we have, one for each office as well, a lot of them have been working in the field in their area for a long time. So here, Kizzy Williams has been working in the field for about 15 or 20 years. She's wonderful, brilliant. Um, Grace Tejas in our Columbus office is the same thing. She's been working in the field for about you know, 15, 20 years. And they because they've been working for so long and have worked for other agencies before coming here, they kind of have their own specialties. So Grace works a lot with foreign national victims. Kizzy works a lot with juveniles and domestic victims, mostly in sex trafficking. Grace does a lot of labor trafficking. So the offices sort of grew organically to have that demographic based on the advocates and their relationships in the community. I see. So we've really actively tried to balance that out and that's what we're doing right now okay what, so it's shifted a little what do the program managers do and what do the client advocates do program managers is going to sound silly manage the program <laughs> right <laughs> but they but they're, they're they're in a way that you know they report to the managing attorney but they kind of handle all the little things that maybe client advocates or attorneys aren't so great at doing right so they're not not really an office manager they're you know, they're doing intake, they're deciding which clients, you know, might probably qualify for services, um, helping figure out which advocate might be the best one to work with them based on personality and experience and just kind of general feeling, um, communicating with the courts, and they're just kind of your all around heart of what we're doing. Um, and the, you know, program managers we have are fantastic. Uh, Roxy Matani in Tennessee, uh, Donna Hoffman in Columbus and Takara Nunn, who just started with us in Toledo, and she's wonderful. And they really have like make the difference for I think for our clients and for you know being out in the community and partners and things like that. Client advocates are like lawyer translators <laughs> in a way. Um, so they kind of perform. They do perform um, some related paralegal functions depending on their background and skill. Uh, they're not drafting motions or anything, but they're, you know, helping us with investigations, helping us gather records, maybe helping, you know, other things. But a lot of times they handle. So a lot of lawyers are great, have great social skills and maybe are great with people, but they're not all. And even you find a lawyer who has great social skills and is great with people, we're probably not as good as a social worker would be. So that's what they do. Okay. They do that. They help you. And, or, you know, sometimes you guys may, I don't know if you've had this or not, but I know I was used to be a magistrate briefly in um, municipal court before we got our big grant. I mm -hmm. realized I couldn't do both at the same time. <laughs> um, 
they, you know, people would come and, and you give them legal advice and they say, yeah, yeah, I would totally understand. And then they leave and they're like, I have no idea what you just said. And then they call you later, they call your secretary and they're like, I'm sorry, what did this person say? And they say, oh, it's this. And oh, okay. So we say yes. And they, they just nod and say, yes, I agree. And we think we're being clear, but we're probably using some lawyer lingo. We're probably maybe not being as clear as we think we are. And so advocates really help translate. Here's what they mean in plain language. Here's what's going on. And they also, you know, they work as agents for us to help communicate, commun you know, facilitate communication and also as agents for the client to help facilitate communication mm -hmm. with us. So a lot of times people um, aren't really excited to call their lawyers, <laughs> right? Because it might bring up some sad stuff or they're maybe embarrassed about something that happened or they don't necessarily want to say, um, but they'll maybe we'll talk to Kizzy or they'll talk to Rachel or they'll talk to Takara, right? They'll talk to Grace, they'll talk to Andrea, maybe before they want to come and call me. Wow. So that'll happen too. If it's an issue that's a legal issue, they say, you know, I mean, let me check with the, check with the lawyers and I'll get back to you. But they do that. They also do a lot of case coordination. So they're able to say, okay, this person has three case managers. They have meds. They have this other thing. They have a court case here. They have a court case here. They have a potential get issue here that we might be able to head off at the past and it doesn't become a court case. And they're able to kind of help coordinate all of that for each client. So they sort of act as a a hub for all the other service providers. Mm -hmm. And then the program managers then are the hub for the internal to see like, what is this advocate doing? What's happening with this case? And to pull it, if that helps a little bit. Yeah, that's fantastic. I could see why that would be extremely helpful to someone it's, in that it, position. It is. The nurse advocate position evolved because me going down to the hospital and asking questions doesn't mm -hmm. go very far because as soon as you say lawyer, people are like, yes. yeah. Even if I'm not trying to be scary, <laughs> <laughs> we're scary anyway. So that didn't go well. And then we had our advocates would go down to try and advocate. And that went a little better. But the difference between even our most skilled advocate and a, a, a nurse to go and ask those same questions was staggering. Wow. Like what she got, she got done, what took us months to not do well, she got done in a week. Just because she's, you know, she's, they know her, she's able to speak. And just fantastic. And that her name is Chelsea Padilla. She worked for us as a volunteer first and then took that intake and outreach position and then went to school for nursing, got her master's. And um, can we steal her? <laughs> yeah, no, you cannot have her. Thank you. But no, no, she's lovely. She's wonderful. Um, but she's developed, you know, she's really developing this program. We just got a demonstration grant for, for that program to build it out. So hopefully wow. replicate. And so. So how do your clients find you? Some of them are referred from the court, all different courts. Um, sometimes we'll get calls from you know different court personnel saying, you know, hey, we've got somebody here, we think maybe you can help them. Um, sometimes it's self-referral, they just are looking for some help and they find us, Google and find us. Um, a lot of times it's other clients, which is really nice to hear that we're doing enough, good enough job that other clients are like, hey, I wonder if you could help my friend. You know, they're also having this issue. Um, it can be from other lawyers, it can be law enforcement, prosecutors, um, all, all kinds of different things. Sometimes we do trainings, and then somebody did a training just maybe happens to know somebody and they'll call us. So all kinds of different referral sources. You have locations in Toledo, Columbus, and Nashville? Yep. Um, what's the reasoning for those locations? Well, Toledo, I'm here. Yes. Uh, Columbus, it's, we, as I was writing the safe harbor law, I was down in Columbus a lot. Mm. I had never written a law before. I had no idea what it meant. Joe Zellman hadn't either. And at, through the process, we were like, I can't believe this is how this works, but okay. <laughs> so, all right. So now we know. So we went down a lot. We testified a lot. We met with a lot of people. Okay. You know, they would invite us down. Um, and kind of during that process, then we made connections there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, we really need somebody down there. And we know there was at the, that time something called the Greif Fellowship through OSU, which has since ended, unfortunately. Okay. But they worked with minors you know, juveniles only involved in human trafficking. There was nobody to work, to provide legal services for adults. And the longer I did it, the more I realized there was nobody that really specialized in working with trafficking victims that provided legal services. And there still isn't that many people. So I'm the kind of person that if I'm like, well, let's just make it. <laughs> Which sounds absurd now that I say it, but at the time it seemed like, well, we don't have this, so maybe we can figure out how to do it. And so we just did. Um, through lots of trial and error. So the person who heads that office now is the one that started out with us, was our first employee, Emily Dunlap, who is a phenomenal attorney. And, you know, just the journey from going, you know, 
forward was pretty, pretty incredible. And we would get referrals from Columbus too, because there was nobody to provide services. And I thought I can't keep going. I can't keep, you know, I can't work those cases from here very well. And so we hired Emily and then we ended up hiring some other people. And Nashville was because that, that law student actually did oh my start her own office there. We like to ask people about their journeys. I'm yeah. assuming when you were in high school, this isn't exactly no. the place you thought you'd end up. No, in fact, I was trying to avoid being a lawyer <laughs> very actively. So why don't you tell us, like, where'd you go to high school and college? And- uh, so I went to Notre Dame Academy for most of my years. I finished at Southview. Um because I think they said I wasn't applying myself, which was probably oh. tr- which was probably true. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go with my friends over there. And so I did. Like, it, so silly. But at the time, I was like, that's what my dad was like. Are you sure? Because I don't know about this. And I was like, no, this is what I want. And he said, okay, fine. So I finished Southview, which was great. I liked Southview, but I probably should have stayed at Notre Dame. <laughs> um, then I went to college. Um, and I was just trying to figure out what I wanted. Um, so I come from a long line of lawyers. <laughs> of various sorts. Um, there has been a lawyer who is a prosecutor specifically that is a Matamo, I think for the last hundred years in Lucas County, either federal or city or state so or something. Are, what are your parents' names? Uh, my dad is Charles Matamo Chuck. So he's a police officer. Well, he's a ranger and now he's retired, sort of retires and he gets bored and he goes back and he <laughs> retires and he goes back. And right now he's actually um, working to co-found a park in oh. Ottawa County. So the Ottawa County Metro Parks, he's working with them as they build that park system. He worked for Toledo Metro Parks for a while. His dad was a uh, bankruptcy judge and he went to law school for a while, I think two years, and then thought, you know, I don't want to be stuck in an office. I like to be out in the field. So he ended up doing that and he felt that he was missing me growing up because I was a little girl when he was going. So he quit. Uh, My cousin John is a lawyer, John Matamo, John I, and then his dad. um, Also, and then my grandfather was a federal judge. My uncle was a federal bankruptcy judge. I think there's more of them. They're, they're <laughs> lousy with lawyers. John's brother is a tax attorney in Columbus. <laughs> and so they used to, there's always a joke. There's a picture of my grandfather holding me, and I'm always like, oh, you were you were brainwashing me when I was an infant, were you? So as a very rebellious, rather, rather I, I just say very rebellious, but probably I'm not compared to lots of people. <laughs> rebellious teenager. I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be a lawyer. I'm just a male. So when no. you went to law school, <laughs> where did you think you were going to end up? I actually didn't apply to law school purpose. I mean, I did, but I I went to school for anthropology and international relations. Oh, wow. I, I was going to do a double major, and then I got impatient and decided I wanted to just graduate. So graduate with international um, relations as a major, and then I went to apply for my master's degree, and I applied to a couple of different schools, and there were some you could apply for a dual program, and I don't know what got into me, but I was like, well... It's not extra money to apply for the JDMA, so I just did them both. And for a couple of them, checked them both. Um, I got waitlisted at American. I uh, missed the deadline to OSU by one day. Oh, no. So I didn't, and I didn't reapply, but I got into UT. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Maybe this is meant to be. Maybe I should do it. Yeah. So I did. Well, it worked out. It worked out okay, but at the time I had this whole plan. Like, usually when I start something, I finish it, but that got out of control, so. I didn't, it wasn't, I didn't intend to apply to law school. I kind of side applied to law school. Yeah. If somebody wants to volunteer or donate, yeah. um, what opportunities are available and how would you go about doing that? So volunteering and donating are both really helpful and meaningful um, because we receive federal funding. So we receive federal funding from you know, the government and then pat, what they call pass-through funding that's administered by the state or the county. Most of those require what they call a match which means you have to come up with 25% in donated services or cash. Cash is often really hard to come up with that match. Those are also reimbursement-based grants, which means you have to put the money out first and then you get reimbursed, which is fine. But having in-kind donations is really helpful. So that a lot of times is donations of professional services. So pro bono attorneys, pro bono, you know, consulting of any kind. Um, you know, we have a board member that does us a lot of our like logos and design work and she donates that time. So anything like that. So donating your own time to help a client or to help the organization, we can use that as match for our grants and that's required for us. And so that helps us enormously. Okay. Um, donating of course is always helpful as well because it's reimbursement based. So you have to have that there. Um, and there's a lot of things grants don't cover necessarily. So we have a little program. It's like a little care packages program. That's, you know, I start, you know, we have clients who maybe it's their first baby or it's their first apartment. And I remember thinking when I was little, like my parents always got me little 
care package. They and they sometimes sometimes they do have family that they're t- talking to, and it's great. But sometimes we have clients who who aren't in contact with their family. Um, we ended up having a baby shower one time for someone, and our staff is who attended because they didn't have anybody to come. So we bought them presents. So sometimes just little donations like that are really helpful because there's not a lot of grants that will cover that. So having you know a little bit of available to do that is really great. You can go to the website to donate. I believe we have a text to give. We have, um, you just send an old-fashioned check. Are yeah. you on social media? Oh, yes, we're on social oh, media. Yes. Uh, Donna Hoffman does a lot of our social media, which we're very <laughs> grateful for her doing. She's much better at it than the lawyers. We write very long social media posts, and she's really phenomenal at... Um, you know, just, just doing a really great job with them. So she does a lot of our social media. So you can always follow us on Facebook, Instagram. I think we're still on Twitter and that's it. Fantastic. Yeah. We'll have to I have all these grand plans, but then I keep getting sidetracked. You have so. to practice law in there too. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I've been able to step away of that from that a little bit because we've been able to hire managing attorneys. We've gotten some grants to do that, which is great and Good. concentrate more on really being an executive director. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hoping to do is, you know, have, um, at least one more person and finding maybe some, some funding for kind of an operations manager or someone to kind of help us do that. And then eventually have some assistant director would be great wow. or director of legal, you know, legal services director or somebody to eventually down the line. Sure. So it's not just me. So we want to thank you for being with us. Um, yeah. it's a tremendous organization. Thank you. Um, I think it's something that people should consider volunteering or donating to. Why don't you just give us your website address and your phone yeah. number? Of course. It's um, www.advocatingopportunity.com. At the time that we named that, it seemed reasonable. And now that I create emails, I'm like, wow, I should have made that short. <laughs> <laughs> but it, there's no S on it. It's not opportunities. Okay. I forgot in the Midwest, we like to add an S to everything yeah, as well. We so advocating opportunity. Sometimes it helps if you capitalize the A and the O. Mm. Um, you could do that. And you, know, you should be able to pop right up. Usually even if you just Google my name, It'll pop up, um, so you can donate there. And you know, other volunteer stuff. Sometimes we just have, you know, we get our donation closet. Just can come help us organize it. Or you know, we need. Sometimes we'll have like a last minute request for, you know, somebody. We had somebody came in to testify against their trafficker, and they were from another state. They had moved away, and she needed. She didn't have any clothes. She needed food while she was there. She needed a lot of things, and. Um, the prosecutor's office, you know, can, can help with some of that, but they can't help with everything. And so we had a, a couple of local churches step up and, and really just, you know, bring some hot meals for her and some stuff. So she didn't feel, she had stuff and didn't feel alone. Um, so that's, sometimes that's really helpful. We keep trying to get together a Christmas drive, but every time we do, <laughs> so we're not, not very good about that. We try that. So sometimes that, um, we had some volunteers who were going to do a Christmas drive for us and then they weren't able to do it. So even coming in to volunteer to organize a Christmas drive would be great. So, and you know, sometimes there are things that we don't know we need until someone says, Hey, what about this? I'm like, oh, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Please, <laughs> yeah, please come help us. That sounds great. Or even just a general volunteer, like I, mean, I could use somebody to help us. Just, just sometimes with little things that pop up. Thank you very much. Yeah. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me.